Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Robinson, and I'm presenting part two of maxillary mandibular advancement for obstructive sleep apnea. I would encourage you to watch part one before watching this particular video. In part two, I explain further a case example and have the patient give his own testimony. Maxillary mandibular advancement opens the airway at all three levels, at the base of the nose, at the soft palate, and also at the base of the tongue. By advancing the airway, the volume is increased according to Prasuli's law, which shows that the radius to the fourth power is inversely proportional to the air pressure change or volume flow. This means that a small opening and increase in the air can improve the airway dimensions. In this case, presentation of a 24-year-old male with a normal BMI of 19, uh, he has difficulty chewing, daytime sleepiness, He's tired, he's failed uh, CPAP, even after two sleep studies. You can see he's a handsome man, but his overall lower jaw appears to be retrusive. In fact, in x-ray it shows that his facial proportions are slightly retruded uh, overall, although the angles themselves appear to be close to normal. The uvula is elongated and the soft palate um, uh, hangs down the back of his throat and he shows the obstruction. In the profile view, the x-ray shows that it is uh, both retrusive from the angle, angle areas. On the three-dimensional airway scans, you can see the narrowness of the axial view of only 107 uh, square millimeters. This means that he's essentially breathing through a straw contributing to his symptoms. In planning the maxillary mandibular advancement surgery, it appears that we can advance his mandible approximately 12 millimeters. This would be substantial uh, for him. In the actual surgery, I was able to advance him close to 18 millimeters, which included the advancement of the chin to even open the airway further. You can see this substantial change uh, in the dimensions. His facial relationship went from acute to obtuse, but still within the normal range, and you can see the substantial increase in the posterior airway space and the shortening of the uvula. Facially, he is handsome. He has a well-defined jawline and good upper lip support, and uh, at two weeks, only a small amount of residual swelling. The length of his lower jaw is now significant compared to his tracheal position, and uh, the overall jawline and mid-face are in excellent position facially. A postoperative three-dimensional airway scan shows the great increase in the airway volumes and surface area, particularly in the axial view. Now it is over 360 square millimeters. This can be compared to the preoperative uh, dimension and shows the substantial increase at the narrowest region at the base of the throat and back of the tongue. Now this has changed the volume overall so that there is a 167 percent increase in the patient's airway volume. This means that his post-operative sleep study has taken him from an AHA of 14 and a 63 during REM sleep during the second study to zero. He no longer has obstructive sleep apnea, and he no longer requires CPAP. And um, what was going on that prompted you to have the jaw surgery? Um, I had sleep apnea, and I just I could not couldn't stay asleep. I'd wake up like seemed like 50 times a night. Uh, I was always short of breath, and uh, also I had like problems kind of eating and just like jaw pain and stuff. Okay. And you, you were on CPAP though, right? Right. Now, you said you had some difficulty with that? Yeah, I had a hard time at first keeping the CPAP on at night just because it was really uncomfortable. And then even with it, it, I just didn't feel like, even once I'd be able to keep it on, I still would wake up tons throughout the night and I just, I didn't feel like I'd be rested. I'd sleep through the night maybe. Um, but I'd still wake up and like all day, be yawning every like 10 minutes and just, like it seemed like I was constantly needing to fall asleep. Like I do have to do multiple energy drinks a day just to stay like stay awake. Yeah. Now you're two weeks after surgery, so are you noticing any difference compared to before surgery? 
Uh, yeah, so far I've definitely noticed I can like I stay asleep a lot better, and just when I'm asleep, I like I can just lay there and I, I breathe a lot easier, um, and I, I don't feel like I, I don't wake up at night feeling out of breath or anything. And in the morning, even with waking up a couple times throughout the night to take pain meds and stuff, I still wake up in the morning. And after like seven hours of sleep or something and feel completely rested all day. Wow, okay, big difference. Now your mom's here, so I've got to ask her a couple of questions because she's been sort of, uh, oh, you know, we've been battling the insurance with this. So um, tell me about Jeff sleeping before the surgery. What was it like for him when you would observe him sleeping? Um, just like he said, he would wake up numerous times um, snored a lot, very, very intense, very loud, and just would um, be exhausted all day. Jeff works with us in the family business and, like he said, was constantly yawning, tired all the time, lack of energy, couldn't do cardio workouts because he gets short of breath. Um, it was really affecting his life to yeah. a great extent. Yeah. To a great extent. So, um, now, we had trouble getting the insurance to approve this. Yeah, and uh, it still hasn't been. It still hasn't been. <laughs> they're just not considering it medically necessary. Um, I think they're looking at it more as dental slash cosmetic. And I look at it as um, I see the difference in his breathing capability now and his, uh, what his oxygen levels are now. Um, and it's, it's a lot, lot better. So, and I do consider it, it was medically necessary for him to function and stay healthy and lead an active life. Well, um, thanks for sort of explaining that because sometimes not everybody understands uh, what it does. So, um, Now, do you have anything to say to people who are contemplating this type of surgery besides radical? <laughs> um, no, really, I think it's something I'm really glad I did. Uh, obviously, there's you know drawbacks to it with not being able to eat, and the it really actually wasn't really painful to be yeah. honest. Um, I thought it'd be a lot more. I thought it'd be more painful than it was, but it's more just been just the kind of discomfort and and just uh, um, and like a little bit of an inconvenience, you know. But yeah. uh, I would say if someone's considering it to, and they think it can definitely help them out in the long run, it's definitely worth putting up with a little bit of discomfort and all in the short run to make sure that you can have a, you know, be able to breathe well and, and have a good quality of life later on. Yeah. And you're you're hungry all the time right now. I'm very hungry. <laughs> so you, you have another four weeks before we can turn you loose to eat that hamburger. Then. Exactly. All I right. will eat a bunch at that point. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Maxillary mandibular advancement for obstructive sleep apnea can be seen as taking a pug and changing him into a greyhound. I hope you've enjoyed watching part two, and if we can help you with your obstructive sleep apnea problem, please contact us at sleepapneasurgicure.com or robinsoncosmeticsurgery.com. Thank you for your attention.